my major task is I must separate the filmmaker from the man who made Cannonball <laughs> and Stroke Race. I don't give a shit. That's the man who made Sharky's Machine. Because you're fucking up my city. And who's about to make another film. And that's the direction that I want to go in. After reading Elnor Leonard's 1982 crime novel, Stick, Bird was inspired to once again take a seat in the director's chair. It was a book that I liked. Elmore Leonard is a wonderful writer. And it also was about Florida, which I love. And I hope that this is just the beginning of many Burt Reynolds films in Florida. With Leonard writing the screenplay and Burt looking to move into directing full-time, this was the perfect project for his 40th film as an actor and fourth as director. And the lead character was a character that I'd never played before. It was a very much a Bogart, Garfield, Eastwood kind of character. Things got off to a good start with a modest $15 million budget, so Bert assembled a talented cast, including Richard Lawson. <laughs> this gonna be some funny shit. Jose Perez as Stick's little buddy Rainey. Hot on, relax. What is it with you? Vicky Frederick as Rory. Very sweet. Very sweet. Could you do me a favor? Do you think you can maybe give me a ride home after? Bert casts Sachi Parker, the daughter of his Cannonball Run 2 co-star, Shirley MacLaine, making her feature film debut as Bobby. You call that guy short of? He's a child molester. Do I look like a child? No, you don't. You remind me of somebody. My daughter. Is that good? Yeah, that's good. I'm in a film that comes out in August with Burt Reynolds called Stick. Best known for her role in Ghostbusters. We got one! Annie Potts. I think half those guys at that meeting today are dealers. You're there to get the dope on the dopers. Bingo. The great Charles Durning. You don't have much there, do you? You should have an operation. Get yourself a set of double D's. In one of his more colorful roles as Chucky. Now, I didn't promise you five. I promised it to the little spick, and he got himself dead. <laughs> now, I wonder if Durning's Chucky inspired the serial killer doll in the 1988 film Child's Play. Hi, I'm Chucky. Wanna play? <laughs> Well, I'm not done with you. Well, I'm done with you, you tub of shit. Bert's starting over co-star Candace Bergen. Good afternoon. Incredibly intelligent, super talented. If he threatens you, I'm going to... I'm going to tell him... What? I'm going to tell him something. <laughs> I haven't worked it out yet. And a very underrated actress because she's so pretty and thank God I had the good fortune of being in a movie with her where she was nominated for an Academy Award. I think it's really that as an actor, he knows the fear that actors have and he knows what's involved in terms of making a fool of yourself in front of people and on film. Nothing's that funny. And I think what he gives you as an actor that's important is he gives you a safe place to take chances. Stickley, don't make promises you can't keep. Trust me, you won't look silly on film. I just won't let that happen. Be it ever so humble, there's no place like a three and a half million dollar home. Playing Barry Braun, the great George Siegel is a standout with his performance. What is the last thing that goes through a bug's mind as it hits the windshield? I don't know. What? It's asshole. <laughs> From an actor's point of view, it gives you incredible confidence. Hey, it's worth another hundred. You got it. Hey, baby. And he's a fast director. That means he'll print fast. He knows what he has, and he knows what he's got when he's got it. Good for me. Got it. Rounding out this stellar cast was Bert's longtime friend and stuntman, Dar Robinson, who was making his feature film acting debut. What the fuck you looking at? I never saw anybody with bunny eyes before. Dar said, well, I want to be an actor. Okay, so I said, well, I'll, well, somewhere down the line, I'll find a part for you where you can act and eventually we'll blow you out of, <laughs> out of window or something. He's dressed up like some dipshit driver. Want me to take him out? This script came along. Man, it wasn't a small part, it was a big part. 
I was concerned about whether he could do it, but I wasn't nearly as concerned as the studio was. Uh, I'm on page 12 of this stupid book, and I don't get it. This is like one of those afternoon soap operas my wife Betty watches. Uh, what kind of a name is Ernest Stickley? Ridiculous! Who plays the heavy in this thing? Well, sir, Bell was Sarcastic's friend and stuntman, Dad Robinson. A stuntman? Uh-oh, what else has he done? Nothing, sir. This will be his first ever movie. First role? I don't know if I like that. You mean he can say his lines and then throw his ass out of a window? Yes, sir. And birds say he'll be an albino to make him more menacing in the role. Well, those pasty white dead-eyed fuckers scare the shit out of me. Perfect villain. Just make sure that some bitch saves the big stomp for last. Can't afford to do reshoots if this shit goes bad. It's okay, it's okay. I'll take it. I want to say hello to Nectar anyway. And when I finally made up my mind that he was going to do it, there wasn't anybody that could talk me out of it. Dog shot me. In this eye and in an accident that nearly cost Bert his eyesight, Dar shoots at him after being thrown from a van. He was going backwards and he tripped and the full load hit me in the eye. The blank from the gun hit Bert in the eye, knocking him out, and he had to be rushed to the hospital by a helicopter. Do you want a bigger one? No. Legally blind in this eye. Just like in Sharky's Machine, Dar Robinson was the highlight of the film's big finale. I said to him, Dar, I want you to do something in this picture that I don't want just to fall. I want something spectacular. And what are we going to do? I don't want something that's been done before. And he said, OK. So from the 22nd floor of this Miami building, Dar got to work on what would be Moki's spectacular death scene. And then the stunt became so dangerous it was beyond belief because he was going to go off this building backwards with no airbag. Preparation and rehearsal would take weeks. Not only did Dar have to focus on his very first acting role in a major studio film, Where's Stick? but now was planning his most death-defying stunt to date. Gary. Yeah, Dar. We're secure here. Let's go for our first test. He had this incredible ability to almost be alone in thousands of people. Kenny, how high are we off the ground? Like 10 feet. That's too close. I mean, he was able to just his concentration of who he was, who he thought he was. Roll camera. And I think he was right about who he thought he was. He was a very confident man. From a lower floor, Dar tests the now fully engineered jump with only a wire attached to his ankle and chest. <laughs> This complex hydraulic system decelerates his velocity in the final seconds of the fall. Dar dressed up as Chucky, fat suit and all, to make this forward-facing fall before doing the final, more difficult stunt. Give me a hand, you son of a bitch! With all the principal photography completed, the studio allowed for one of their main cast members to perform the stunt. Why don't you push real hard? <laughs> You might hit the water. The big budget feature could never have gotten insurance otherwise. I felt very strongly that maybe I'd bitten off more than I could chew. I was getting very, very concerned about it. And I kept trying to read something in his eyes, you know, that would tell me that this is not a good idea, you know. But there wasn't a hint that he had a second where he didn't think this was going to go off to perfection. There wasn't a doubt. There also wasn't a doubt that it was unbelievably dangerous. Okay, I'll take a minute to myself. Everybody test the cameras, please. Anybody who says that they're not afraid of this type of work is either foolish or crazy. I don't want to get on the rail until we are ready, just in case I get a slip. No, I understand. Okay, okay we're going to bow our heads and take a moment of prayer. And whether you believe in the man upstairs or not, this is for Dar, okay? In a moment of silence and prayer, Bert leads the crew before this very dangerous stunt. Okay, he said he is. He's ready. Okay. And I remember just before he did it, he said, should I empty the gun on the way down? And I thought, no, don't no, think about the gun. Just do whatever you got to do. And he said, no, I think this guy would empty the gun. So with Dar's focus on his most dramatic scene, along with timing for the fall... Roll all your cameras, please. He had all the faith in the world for his crew to help as he falls 20 stories toward concrete. Oh. 
I, I tell you, my heart was in my throat. I mean, it was unbelievable. It was scary, it was thrilling, and I think every guy in the crew felt the same way I did. See you. Thanks, pal. <laughs> Give me the opportunity. Yeah. Everybody felt like we'd all been a part of something that was quite unique. Was oh, the rush? It was a rush. I was busy working. <laughs> I was worried. I, I didn't know what position I was going to be in. I had no idea. I, I think I kind of cuffed it and just kept this part of my body like this still. Well, you were working all the way down. I fired all six shots. I know. Dar Robinson was killed doing a routine stunt. Following Stick, Dar went on to do several pictures, none bigger than Lethal Weapon. <laughs> but in November of 1986, he'd work on what would be his final stunt for the film, Million Dollar Mystery. Dar was on a motorcycle, coming around a corner, he lost it, rolled down the hill, hit a rock, and uh, busted his spleen. And they had no chopper there, which is generally the rule. They should have if they're doing stunts. They put him in the car, and a friend of mine was in the car with him. And halfway to town, he said to the guy, I'm buying the farm. And he passed away. Director Richard Donner dedicated Lethal Weapon to Dar at the close of his film, released four months after his death. I wanted his name on that screen. I just wanted to say thank you, Dora, in the inventiveness and the creativeness that he brought to stunts. And when it came to being in the hands of a Dar Robinson, that was it. He was the one and only. He was very aware of the fact that someone will probably come along and jump higher, jump faster, further. Uh, he was aware of that. But for the time that he was here on this earth, he was the best. And he knew that. Burt Reynolds is Stick. As filming wrapped and Burt turned in his fourth directorial effort, he was proud of the work and stayed true to Elmore Leonard's book and screenplay. I'll say good night. After screening Burt's version of Stick, Universal hated the film and went into full damage control. I don't know what the fuck I just sat through, but that's not the sequel to Sharky's Machine! No, sir. It's about the driven piece like the book. Didn't you read it? I can't read every goddamn script. That's what you assholes are for. How are we gonna fix this? Well, we can move over August release days, push it back to next year. Do it. And where's that bandit guy? He's got to reshoot this piece of shit and quick! Well, sir, he just finished the film with Clint Eastwood, but he has been very sick. I'm not sure he can do it. You kidding me? That guy's the toughest son of a bitch on the planet. What's he got? The shits? A little diarrhea? A shattered jaw, sir. I hear he drinks all his meals through a straw. Ah, horseshit. He'll do it. Get me somebody cheap to rewrite this boring-ass script. Uh, Betty, get Bert in here right away. So now it was up to Bert's agent to break the difficult news to him. David, you have Mr. Reynolds on line three. Uh, okay, Sally, close the door. Bert, you sweet, handsome bastard. Listen, buddy, I've got some bad news. You gotta get over to Universal and see the big guy. What do I have to do that for? What the hell is going on? He pulled the film stick. They they hate it, buddy. God damn it. Fucking ridiculous. I know. I'm sorry, Bert. He's got some ideas on uh, how to fix it. Fix it? There's nothing wrong with it. I mean, it's probably just a couple of reshoots, you know, some editing. It can't be that bad. These assholes probably never even read the damn book. It's not me, buddy. It, you know, Sidney, he's a clueless moron. Son of a bitch. These studio shitheads are going to ruin my picture. L listen, it's just going to be better for your career, Bert, if you just do what Universal wants. I'm in no shape to direct reshoots right now. This ain't going to work. Oh, shit. Poor son of a bitch. Despite the fact that they had billboards, posters, trailers, and TV spots running... You know what I came here to ask. Universal scrapped the August 84 release date and brought Burt back to discuss their issues with the film. I caught a free train south about the time I thought I'd lose my mind. Now the first thing we gotta change is this music. I mean, not since Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid used raindrops keep falling on my head as a film sounded so weak and pathetic. We need something tougher there, Bert. Something that would make John Wayne proud. What? Now let's skip forward to this scene. Great one, really intense. But what the hell is this? 
Gotta lose that laugh, Bird. I mean, I was waiting for Captain Chaos to come out and start slapping the shit out of both of you. Okay, I'll do it. All right, now on to the training montage. I, I, I don't even know what to say, man. I mean, did you pick this song? What is that, Cheech and Chong? Uh, who's singing that? Y la amistad es gratis, y se vende. Change that shit, too. All right, I'll do something else together, I said. Tell him what it was like to do seven years in the world's biggest slammer. Now, this one makes me a little uncomfortable. It's a little too close to home, if you know what I mean. Did you ever have to, um, you know, with other convicts? Well, I had this chubby little roommate, sweet little guy, round. One night he brought home some oil margarine. It's one of the most memorable nights of my entire life. You and the old man ever tried that, oil margarine? Now, nobody wants to hear about your gay prison sex. You gotta cut all that out. Okay. A foggy day. And right after that, Steven Seagal starts singing. This is garbage. Get rid of it. I I'm surprised you didn't have him sing over the training montage. What? Now, this one was a tough one for me because the hero needs to get laid, of course. But my secretary, Betty, even says that it's gratuitous. I have no idea what that means, but it sounds bad. You gotta get it out of there. Did you ever tell me your name? No. Well, whoever you are, you're very good. Thank you. Besides, you you look like a Chippendales dancer with that bow tie on. I don't like this shit. Relax, we're almost done. Jump to Annie Potts. Listen to this. Give me a break. Can you believe this piece of shit? <laughs> that voice. It kills me, Bert. I can't listen to it for more than ten seconds without covering my ears. I got that feeling. I mean, you don't even bang her. She's so annoying and there's no sex. It reminds me of my wife. She destroys the movie. I want her cut out every scene. This ain't gonna work. You make this work, I mean, we need more Sharky and less Ernest Stickley. Horrible name, just awful. Go fuck yourself, Chubby. I'm afraid I was right. I don't think I'm ready for you. All right, one last thing. We gotta talk about this ending. That's pathetic, Bert. I mean, our hero needs to get the girl. Uh, either that or he throws her off the balcony. You decide. Some bitch. Look, I'll get you everything you need to fill in all the gaps. Just bring me a higher body count and lose all that sappy shit. You got it, fatty. Thanks, Bert. And eat something, you skinny bastard. So Universal demanded that Bert reshoot portions of the film and re-edit it, reducing the humor and changing the ending. They brought in screenwriter Joseph C. Stinson, who rewrote City Heat, to rewrite the second half of the film to add more action scenes, making the ending more upbeat. Yeah, it's gonna be okay. Along with adding a new subplot with Stick's teenage daughter. Nice car, Dad. Pretty fancy. Isn't it a little obvious? Enough, huh? I'm a chauffeur. It's all legal. Right. Also, the musical score was completely re-recorded to present a darker, more intense tone to the picture. As a result of the reshoots, Castello Guerrera, who had only appeared in a few short scenes, You still owe me a life would now have his role as Nestor expanded to be the main villain in the picture. You're a fool, Stick. Saved all your letters. Both of them. Also included in the reshoots making her big screen debut was Carrie Fisher's half-sister, Trisha Lay Fisher, playing Stick's daughter, Katie. Dad, I'm 15. In what must have been a shocking disappointment to those who were cut from the film... Got it. Realize for me. Great. Bert had to make difficult choices in trying to make the film work with the new screenplay. As a result, all of Annie Potts' scenes were left on the cutting room floor. Are you actually reading this? Barry, this is very nice. Mm, Rory! Also cut from the film was Barry Braun's mistress, Rory, played by Vicki Frederick. God, I love you. <laughs> Jesus. Country Western singer Tammy Wynette was to make her feature film acting debut in Stick, but her character never made it into the final version of the movie. I have been and will be forever the biggest Tammy Wynette fan in the world. As Bert filmed the reshoots, he was clearly not the same healthy Bert from a year ago. What the hell are you doing calling me a clown? Well, I wasn't talking about you, pal. I was talking about your outfit. He appears 
painfully thin in the new scenes, and although some of the audience didn't notice, many could see the difference. Are you a foolish man, Stick? I used to be. At times, it seems he is really not playing the character in the same way. Sit right here and listen to the ducks. Bert's mustache and hair seem different as well. But most of all, his weight loss, especially in his face, shows the contrast between the new scenes and the ones shot before his injury. I worked through a lot of pain. City Heat was all right because I had Clint, but on stick, it, it was over. I'd lost it by that time. I was down to 150 pounds. When I reshot the film, I was just going through the motions. I'm not proud of what I did, but I take responsibility for my actions. I'll clown all over your ass, you fuck with me. All I can say, and this is not in way of a defense, is if you liked the first part of Stick, that's what I was trying to achieve throughout. You got some balls. That's what everybody says. With Bert's agent convincing him to go along with what Universal wanted, his vision was compromised during one of the most challenging times of his life. I gave up on the film. I didn't fight them. I let them get the best of me. As the film no longer focused on the characters and relationships, the poster was changed to a more traditional action theme, promising what the reshoots delivered. We've had problems with it, and we've gone back and reshot about three scenes. Hopefully, it can make it a little more commercial. As the film ends, the Anne Murray song, I Don't Think I'm Ready For You, plays over the end credits of both versions of the film. The song was co-written by Bert and was specifically meant for his original version of the movie. I don't think I'm ready for you. The lyrics fit perfectly with Candace Bergen walking away from Bert, realizing he was not the man for her. But used here in the final theatrical release, it no longer makes sense for this happy ending. with the two laughing and ultimately embracing for their final moments on screen. Perhaps they should have just thrown out the end credits song and gone with the more traditional outtakes instead. Your friend of yours? <laughs> you should pay me now, yeah. You bozo have got some balls. <laughs> you got some you got some spaghetti hanging out of your mouth. What do you want? I want this thing. <laughs> hey, let's. Can you get. <laughs> when Elmore Leonard finally saw the finished film, he absolutely hated it. Even if I was involved in a movie like Stick and I said unflattering things about it, it's because I didn't think it was a good movie. Leonard was quoted as saying, it's not what I wrote, it's not my book, it's not my screenplay. I'm never too concerned with how closely the adaptation is. That's beside the point. I'm just hopeful that a good movie can be made. He was particularly unhappy with George Siegel's performance as Barry Braun. Do you believe this guy? <laughs> Following the release in April of 1985, it wasn't just Elmore Leonard trashing the film, but most critics as well. It's time for a Siskel and Ebert Burt Reynolds shitty film review. You have a film that's going to be a low-life kind of picture, and it could be a hard, gritty thriller. Yeah. And that would be interesting. Yeah. That's what the book is. <laughs> then they throw in all these comedy elements. Huh? You know, I haven't seen anything like that since I was at my grandmother's house. She opened the refrigerator door, and the light came on. Is that right? Burt Reynolds directed this picture. What is he doing? I never care. Oh, I started to say something really bitchy. Why should I resort to what he does? Not going to do it. If you're going to buy a book like that, if you're going to option a book like that, do the book. I have been known to say things about those people, yeah. and they do get P.O. They write it down in their little book. They say, oh, wait till the next one comes out. Don't throw in comedy stuff like the best little whorehouse in Texas with Charles Gurney walking around. Oh, nobody's smarter, nobody's slicker. Or George Siegel, who is one of my least favorite actors. What do you call a boomerang that doesn't come back? A stick! <laughs> 
He may like my next film. Maybe not. Do you read one of these books that reads like a movie script? It's all there. The dialogue is there. The characters are there. The settings are there. Why transform it by taking a, a basically a good book and turning it into something that's unbelievable on television? Unbelievable. You know, somebody's always being nice and saying, look what they said about yeah. you. And then if you say, well, I don't want to see that, they say, well, let me read it to you. You should get out of the business and go into another line of work. The waste of good material. It is a waste. No, hold on. <laughs> And that's the end of this Siskel and Ebert Burt Reynolds shitty film review. Stick opened at number one, his first to top the list since the best little whorehouse in Texas, knocking Police Academy 2 from the top spot. But as the bad reviews rolled in, the film dropped to seventh place in its second week. It was a real character study before, and I think it probably would have been a wonderful piece of film for me, but wouldn't have done a lot of box office because it didn't have a lot of action in it. But now it's loaded with action. In the end, the studio got what they wanted, but for Bert, his health had deteriorated in this, his most difficult period of his life to date. After stick, I'm going to lie down for a while. His original version of the film continues to sit on a shelf somewhere while adoring fans wait patiently for its official release. Don't forget to like and subscribe to get notified about new videos and original Burt Reynolds content right here on the Gator McCluskey channel.